I had to ask you one quick question here. So, you fought Bruno Silva. So did Alex Pereira. So, Poetan couldn't finish Bruno Silva. You dropped him on the feet. Does that mean you're a better striker than Poetan? <laughs> I don't know if that means if I'm a better striker or he just softened him up for me and I, I just happened to catch him at the right time. Best podcast in the business. The name is Show Me The Money. Welcome back to the Show Me The Money podcast. Based off of all of your guys' YouTube comments from our last episode, I want to start off by saying Gilbert and Moicano still are not back on the show. But hopefully next week, Gilbert will be on fresh off a win. Moicano will be back to preview his, his fight card in Paris coming up in a couple weeks. However, this week we do have a very special guest. Fresh off a comeback win. My guy, GM3, welcome to the podcast, bro. Thanks for having me on, man. Great to be here. Dude, 100%. I have so many questions for you. I want to talk about so much today. First of all, we have to go into your card or your 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 previous fight. And I want to preview because this weekend you have teammates fighting. You have some, uh, you, you have guys like Shavkat that's hopefully fighting Bilal coming up soon. So I want to get your insight on that. But let's start first and foremost on your fight this past, well, two weeks now. First of all, I made a lot of money on you, so <laughs> so thank you for that. No problem. Um, I took you round two and three. I did a small sprinkle on the KO, so I didn't win that one. But I the fight went exactly how I predicted. You know, you came in, you weathered a storm against Shabazian, and then you just put him out in that second round. So again, thank you for getting me the, the W. I know you get you probably get lots of gamblers that that hit you up for absolutely. Saying. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I actually saw one of your clips on, on uh, you were interviewed on, on YouTube. I was, I was watching one of them and it was, it, you said something like, I don't know why these sports books keep giving me at such big odds on the submission prop. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, it's like every, I have one, all finishes in the UFC, right? Yeah. One of them was like a, a body kick knockout. Everything else was a submission. So, I mean, it's great for you guys. And I mean, even if you, you know, no matter what, yeah, uh, you bet me every time I'm such a big plus money, especially on the submission. Yeah. You know, you're walking away with something. You're, you're <laughs> definitely up right now for sure. Dude, hundred percent. So you could have, uh, gamblers could have took you at four to one. I think it was just to get a finish. I think five to one was the submission. And then I took you round two, three, which is just any finish in those rounds. The KO was 17 to one. That's why I sprinkled on it because I felt like if, you know, if you, if Shabazian gassed out and you could have maybe just like TKO him on the ground, but either way, I made a ton of money. Happy you won the fight. I had to ask you one quick question here. So you fought Bruno Silva. So did Alex Pereira. So Poetan couldn't finish Bruno Silva. You dropped him on the feet. Does that mean you're a better striker than Poetan? <laughs> I don't know if that means if I'm a better striker or he just softened him up for me and I, I just happened to catch him at the right time. But I, I will say getting someone tired, especially when you're doing something that they don't like, and this is, you know, uh, styles make fights and tactics are a big role in like how you tax somebody's energy system. Uh, Bruno Silva likes to stand and bang. You stand up there and just throw hands with him. He could probably do that all day and all night, but yeah. you start shooting at his legs. Even if the takedowns aren't successful, you wear him out that way. People get tired. It gets a lot easier to knock him down. So that's yeah. uh, definitely helped. No, a hundred percent. And I don't know if you saw just recently, I think it was today or yesterday. I think it was yesterday, but Peloton said he wants to go back down to 185 and fight through Plessy. What do you think about that? Because he is a big dude, and that's he's getting up there in age. That's got to be a brutal weight cut. Yeah, man. I, I was on that Miami card, and I saw him cutting and making weight for that, and it, it did not look fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know the specifics, and I'm sure if he's saying that, uh, he, you know, he's a competitor. He wouldn't be doing that if he didn't think he had a legitimate chance of winning right. But yeah. to say that out loud and to go through that weight cut again, you know, like, like he looks – skinnier because he's so tall but he's a big guy yeah. you know what i mean so uh that would i think he should consult the pi first to make sure that's in the cards before he does that because like man you held the belt already it'd be cool to hold two at once but i think he's got a better chance of bouncing between light heavyweight and heavyweight because that's what he you know in kickboxing he did that too so i think yeah. uh just for longevity's sake and even for overall health that's probably the smarter move in my opinion but you can't knock a guy for trying to make a big fight. The overall health the thing is that I think that you nailed it. I, I, that's scary. That's just scary. That's such a big guy. And he's, what, 30, 36 now? 30, 
Something like that. He's yeah. up there in age. Like going back down to 185 is scary. And then through Plessy, like like I think you have a much better chance against Drukas at, at 205. Like I feel like if you if you if he goes down so much in weight, I think Duplessis is going to really try to you know utilize the grappling and the wrestling on him. And then you know if he gets tagged, you know we saw Adesanya put him out cold at that weight class. I don't think Adesanya is doing that to him at 205. So I just think it's interesting that he wants to do this. He has this like terminator mentality where like whoever's on the throne somewhere he just wants to seek them out and go after them so it's pretty crazy but let's talk about your fight so what was the game plan because it seems like everyone that that was on shabazian was on the knockout or the early finish everyone that was on you believed you could fit you could finish him as the fight progressed is that part of your game plan when you're looking at these types of matchups yeah, minus the part where I get dropped and almost finished. <laughs> that was pretty much the game plan. So I, you know, I know he comes out strong. Um, you look at most of his fights, he's generally winning the first round, right? Yeah. Uh, even in the AJ Dobson's uh, last win, he, you know, he was getting beat up at first, but he ends up finishing, coming back. Um, and he's still dangerous in that first round, even when he's losing. If you hurt him enough, he's gonna crack back, and that's when he's still at his best and his freshest. So. That was something to consider, and I knew, you know, I tend to wear on guys. Uh, I figured he would have the speed advantage. Uh, he definitely used his reach and his footwork a little bit better, uh, not just better than me, but even a little bit better than I expected once we got in mm -hmm. there. Uh, and it was a matter of like, all right, if, you know, I'm going to try and feel it out. Hopefully I win the first round, right? I'm, I'm not planning on losing the first round. Yeah. I'm also not going to get, you know, super upset if I don't win it because right. I know he's going to be like, has to win that first one mm -hmm. right and then after that it's like all right now i don't care if i take him down or not we're gonna shoot 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 and either we're fighting in the clinch or i'm getting you down and it's time to go to work and you know again other than getting dropped and even after i got dropped i think that's why a lot of people were so uh you know hyped up about the win is i pop right back up i start shooting like nothing happened and i start throwing hands because it wasn't like a desperation like oh i just found a way and like skimmed out of there by you know the skin of my teeth i was I was in there like, all right, you got yours. Now it's time to get mine. Like, yeah. we're here to fight. So yeah. it was uh, more or less the game plan. Yeah. And so that he, he dropped you with a, was it a body shot? Yes. Yeah. He tried to come in. Uh, I saw the replay. He tried to come in like super, like almost like an uppercut, like straight into the body. And I moved back a little bit. So it ended up kind of like skimming on the outside, yeah. which is almost worse. Like, you know, you get rat tailed by a towel. It's like, if it's too close, it doesn't do much, <laughs> but I moved away just enough where it like Ooh. it hit perfect. And it, you know, I wanted to not go down, but it's one of those things. It's like a foot cramp. Like you don't have a choice. Your body's just like, you know Shuts what? Off. You got us into the position. I'm going down for a little bit. You yeah. figure out the rest. So luckily yeah. I was able to recover, but yeah, that, uh, that body shot definitely sucked. <laughs> do you think the ref was, was close to stopping it? I think I'm sure he was close. Uh, Mark Smith's a great referee, and you know yeah. he told me in the back, he's like, "Hey, if I if I have to vocalize that you need to move and change position, that means I'm looking and that it's close to being stopped." Yeah, so he's very upfront about it. Most guys are, but he's upfront about that. Uh, so I made sure he said, "Hey, you know, you got to move, you got to work. I'm changing position. I'm doing something." Yeah. Uh, Edmund did do a good job initially because if you go back and watch, I'm doing uh, one of two things. I'm either coming in for that low single uh, and if i get enough space i'm going to come up or circle to the back he did a good job like really sprawling flat so then i go back to my back and i get my feet in the hips to try to like push off and it was just a back and forth of either i'm going to get enough space to push you off come up on the single or you're just going to like concede to top which is ended up happening and i'm going to hold you down to break your posture and then i start to work from the guard and like not get punched about the head and shoulders yeah. so much and it seemed like, I don't know if you were doing this intentionally, but you were like gassing him out. Like he, he was gassing himself out. So that, that was one of the first thoughts that went through my head once I knew that like the, I recovered from the body shot. It happened pretty quick, but I was like, oh, this is great. He's going to tire himself <laughs> out. Like I know that it looks awful, right? And yeah. the, the ref saying I got to move, you know, I've been in enough fights where I know what this looks like, even though I'm in it. But that was like, you know, there's always a way to win the fight if I'm conscious. And I was like, this is great. He's going to be tired. And of, <laughs> of course, he was tired. <laughs> Bro, when I was literally watching the fight, I was with some friends and I was like celebrating because I was I obviously had a bet on you. And they're like, why are you getting happy? I'm like, Bro, <laughs> I see what happened. And he's gassing himself out right now. I know what's about to happen next. And it was just so electric. And he came back and got him out of there. And you got to give credit to the referee because there's so much controversy in, in, in MMA, right? And like 
Some people feel some way about certain refs. Some people feel different ways. The reality of it is, is there are t- there's tons of controversy about stoppages being too soon or too late. We've seen some really bad ones. I don't know if you remember the, the Bobby Green one, Jalen Turner. Yes. Bro, I had a I literally bet on Bobby Green and I was still yelling at the TV, yeah. telling this guy, stop this fight. This dude's gonna die. Yeah. Like I was like, you gotta stop the fight, bro. This is the dude's flat out cold on his on his stomach, and you're just letting it go. And obviously, there's no intent behind that. Like it's just uh, he, you know, he just stopped it way too late. But I guess what I'm getting at here is if a ref doesn't stop a fight and then the and then you come back and win, then it was obviously the right choice. Is that how you feel about it? Uh, for mine in particular, yes. And I know, like, not just people betting against me, but, like, yeah, I will agree that I've seen fights stop for less. Does that mean they should have been stopped? It's a case-by-case basis. Right. Uh, you know, I got hit with a body shot and I went down and then I started blocking and moving right away. If I would have got cracked to the head and I was doing the chicken dance... And he would have taken his time and landed a couple more clean ones. Even yeah. if I was still moving, you can't really argue with that, right? Yeah. Um, now, obviously, you can see my face. You know, we're a couple of weeks later, but like even after, I didn't really have any scuffs or marks. Yeah. He was just going for volume to try to get me out of there, right. which is a completely acceptable tactic. Uh, but in this case, it's like you know, body shots generally not going to like hurt you long term. Right. Head shots are a whole different thing. And that's kind of on referee's discretion. And look, they're human beings too. You can't always get it right. And replay is not something like I'm all for replays, but like in the context of a fight and a finishing sequence, there's only so far that can go too, right? Yeah. You guy gets pretty much TKO'd if you go back and decide that like it's fine and you can keep fighting. Well, how the hell does that work? Like yeah. you gave this guy all this time to recover. So yeah. is it ever going to be perfect? No, but in my specific situation... You know, uh, I'm still tr- back to training already. Everything's fine. Right. It was a right call. What? You, so, I get your opinion on the the Cannonier Imovov stoppage. Did you think that one was too early? Cannonier was on his feet. He got wobbled, but he kind of recovered. He never went to the ground. Yeah, this was two fights ago for Cannonier. I don't St- know if you yeah, remember that one. Standing TKOs are always like tough. They're always tough because the guy, no matter what, like we're fighters, right? Yeah, we're like the 0.1% of the population who's like, we're going to get in there for the yeah. most part. And like, especially Kennedy, he's a top five guy. He's fought for the belt before. You, you got to give him the benefit of the doubt. But if you're taking a bunch of unanswered shots, mm-hmm. and again, is there a way maybe he could have come back and won? It's possible. Yeah. But you also know as a competitor, like, yes, you're going to protest it, but you know what it looks like. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I get cracked on the feet and I'm not moving, and they tell you to move, and that's the other thing. Even if you don't agree with it, if the ref says you got to move and you can't move, it is what it is. Like, that I, I totally agree with. Yeah. Because if the ref is giving you the warning on the ground and telling you to do something and you're not doing it, then you're get, as a fighter, you're, you're not throwing in the towel, but you're basically saying, like, I'm covering up, I'm done. And then he calls the fight. Yeah, or even if you can't move, I've you know I've had fights before. I get dropped, and uh, I hear the ref move, move, and I'm trying to move, and I either my body's not letting me, or I get hit with something that makes me wobble, and then I move again, and I'm like, well, I could have kept fighting, and literally could have kept fighting. Yeah, yeah. But what's the point in doing that? Like, you don't let this guy kill me, and then I go back and watch him. Like, okay, that looks bad. It's like, could I, in a literal sense, I feel like I could have kept fighting, but would have done me any good? Yeah. Was it worth whatever damage I would have taken? Probably not. And the bigger thing is, again, I can see what the ref was looking at. And as long as you look at it impartially, it's like it's my job to not get in that position in the first place. It's right. like you don't want to get submitted. Don't get caught in a submission. You know, it's yeah. at the end of the day, you are the only person you know, that you can blame for your loss. You got to hold yourself accountable outside of a freak occurrence. Yeah. So, you know, just don't get beat up and it won't get called. For sure. I remember we had one episode we had Moicano. He was like. He, he literally said, he's like, there's no such thing as a stoppage or a late stoppage or yeah, a late stoppage. He was basically saying that as a fighter, he always wants a chance to come back. Like he hates when it's called yeah. too early. So I get that mentality, but I think the USC or the commission's argument is the health and the safety. <laughs> right, right. And then, and again, if it looks that bad and they got to call it, well, then make sure you don't get dropped first. And I'm, I'm with him on that. Like, yeah. yeah obviously look at my last fight like give me a chance for sure uh but there again you can't get upset especially you know at the moment you can be mad but you go back and watch tape and you look at it if you're like you know what i mean right, like right. pretend it's not you and if you still think that it was like not that bad then maybe there's something there but again at the end of the day don't don't get put in those bad positions and you won't have to worry about it 100 percent. 
So you, you did a, a great call out. So you called out Paul Craig. What excites you? So I got to tell you, first of all, what excites you about that fight? And when are you looking to get back in there? And secondly, I don't know if you saw, but I got to tell you my story on Paul Craig. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that next. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. No matter what, uh, let me just preface everything by saying this. I want to be on that December 14th card in Tampa. I want to get three in this year. Uh, I'm healthy. I want to stay active. Um, that being said, I, I don't want to give away too much because I don't know what's out there in the public or not. But I know Paul Craig has something. I just found out he has something on the books, and he's actually going to be coming to Kill Cliff, as far as I know, to train for it. Okay. So I'm not saying that rules it out completely, but right. for sure in the short term, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Certainly not going to happen on the 14th. Got it, got it. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait on that one or figure something else out. But it's like it. I, I don't even know if uh, anybody in my camp do because I came back in like the first day they're like, hey, by the way, I was like, thanks. <laughs> thanks for telling me, guys. Yeah, I appreciate that. Them out. Up. So. Are there any other guys that come to mind that you think would make sense? Uh, yeah, that that was kind of the one I had set up. I hadn't thought too much past that. I know uh, Alex Fernandez and um, Michelle Pajaya were fighting. They're 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would have thought, one of them maybe but they got something on the books i know chris curtis is number 15 but he's got an injury right now or i, yeah. I think he's still recovering yeah so uh you know i don't if they would give me somebody ranked higher than that i wouldn't say no and you know anything's possible but outside of those guys it was kind of looking to like hopefully get somebody like paul craig has a good name he's been ranked at two different weight classes right uh it's a name that people i've seen suggest before on the internet so i thought that was a, a smart move but since he's taken Pretty much anybody, you know, I'm not opposed to fighting up or down or anything in between because right. I just want to stay active, stay active. And again, sure. rankings don't mean nothing. But if you win and you get finishes, I think that's probably the most important thing. We just saw last week's main event, you know, it was Bahio ranked like number 12 or 13. And he fought the number yep. four guy and jumped all the way up all there. The way, so yeah. it's uh and not he should have got a finish. I mean, that was as close as you can get without getting. So, and there's another. Yeah. Like yeah. he made it to the end of the round. But like even there, it's like, would you know, could they be upset about calling that one? Absolutely. <laughs> I not. just think it's crazy with Cannoneer. The fight where he's standing on the feet gets called. And then the fight where he's on his back or he gets dropped and yeah. slow mo falls to the ground. Doesn't get stopped. So it's just tough. Again, you said you nailed it. The rest are human at the end of the day. And. Not everything's always called the same, but you just have to make the best of it. Um, but I think Kyle looked super good in that fight. I took him by uh, KO or decision. Or no, no. I took him by submission or decision in that fight. So I was sweating the end of it. He's about, <laughs> he's about to TKO like, yeah. him. <laughs> then he had the arm triangle at the end. And I was like, please sub him because the sub would have paid more. But he ended up getting winning on the scorecard. So I was happy with it. But I'm excited to see what he does. I know he called out Israel Adesanya. How do you mm -hmm. think? How do you think that fight would go? Uh, that'd be a fun one to see. I think uh, Kyle's a pretty big kid. Like, I, you know, obviously yeah. I saw him around the, the workout room and stuff. I think Izzy probably has a little bit of reach. Uh, but Kyle probably, like, has longer straight punches down the middle. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be an interesting matchup because I don't think it necessarily favors either of them on the feet uh, unless maybe Izzy's, like, kicks factor in a little bit better than, like, I have a feeling they will because... Like I said, Bahio goes down the middle really well, and he's long enough that I think he would be just as long as Izzy going around the outside, but I think they would uh, kind of stand at range and, like, kickbox with each other enough. I think I could see Bahio start shooting after maybe, like, the first or second round. Yeah. Um, or maybe even in the first round just to, like, help his striking a little bit, but I think it'd be yeah. a fun fight to watch either Were way. Were you surprised? Like, I was very surprised on Kaya's strategy against Cannonier because he didn't even attempt or even... He didn't even look like he was going for a takedown until very late in the fight. I thought he was going to come with a more grapple and heavy approach, but it almost seemed like he wanted to prove a point with his striking in that matchup against Cannonier. Honestly, I I don't I don't know if it's even proven a point. I think that was smart of him because I think he had a lot better reach and distance management than people were factoring in because Got they it. see Cannonier and they just think like you know the dude cracks and like yeah. he's a big scary guy, but Bahio yeah. also hits hard. And again, right. when you manage distance well, I don't know that I'd shoot on Cannonier right away either because he is a very strong, physically powerful guy. So why are you going to meet him when he's fresh 
when he's more likely to just shut down your takedown and maybe wow. catch you with an awkward punch on the way up. So I think that was yeah. actually probably a smart move on That's good part. insight because even if you go back to the Derek Brunson fight, that's exactly what happened. He shot early in round one. It was almost like he was kind of ragdoll on him, but then round two comes out, does that, and gets and, and you know loses his gas tank. Right. And so I think you nailed that perfectly. Um, all right, well, you're you're on a three-fight win streak since the Hamzat Tremaya fight, and now we got to find you a good opponent. I, I love the Paul Craig matchup personally. We'll see if that's able if we're able if that's able to come to fruition or not. There is one thing I want to bring up here. I want to give you the mic for because I saw it on social media and I thought it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. But you shared your 50k performance of the night bonus with all of your coaches. So I wanted to shout you out on the pod for doing that because that's mm -hmm. super super respectable. Is there take me on take me through the thought process of that and why you you, know, you want to take care of your guys when you get a big win like that? Uh, I mean, so pretty much since I've been in the UFC, I try to like make sure I take care of my coaches um, and especially the guys that come with me on the fight trips because, you know, you're taking time away from your families. You're taking time away from whatever else you got going on. Even if you're a coach at the gym, like you're not coaching other guys, you deserve to be compensated for that. Yeah. Right. And uh, especially with the UFC, like since I've been in, you know, I got right in when they had uh, started having the Reebok deal. Right. And now we have the Venom deal. So, I, you know, we don't make as much as like NBA or NFL players or whatever. Right. But I've been in the UFC for a while now. I make a good living doing this. And I know that my Venom money is going to more than cover whatever I'm going to pay the coaches. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And just appreciation for their time and everything else, because like as fighters, you know, it's like you want to save because you never know when you're going to fight. And there's injuries and there's all this other stuff. And, you know, that's I 100 percent understand that. But I also know how it works, and it's like we we get a per diem from the UFC. Yeah, we get our venom money, you know, however much that is for where you're at. And you know, again, could I give my coaches as much before when I was newer? No, but you, you still do something for them. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've been around for a while now, and when I got that, it's like I always try to look at it this way: you're going to pay somebody. You're either going to pay the government more taxes, yeah. or you can give a little more back to the people that help you. Yeah. Right. And I'd rather just sleep better at night, take care of my guys, you know, show them some love. Because, again, it's it's not just that they're taking time. You know, yes, they want to be coaches and start a gym or whatever. But like more than any other sport, the coaches aren't compensated as well as these other big ball sports because we just don't have the backing. Right. You know, that some of those other ones have. Right. We don't have like a, a billionaire owner for each separate gym or team. Yep. Um. And on top of that, like, I'm not going to get what I get and win as much as I do without those guys and their knowledge and, like, their bodies. Because, you know, even, uh, like, I'm not grappling with Henry Hooft, but he's holding pads for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he, he's taking a beating on his body that way. And the other guys that are grappling with me are holding pads. Like, that's not nothing. You for know sure. what I mean? That's You're going to be walking a little bit slower when you're older holding pads for guys like that. So, yeah. you know, I just, I've always tried to do that. I thought it was the right thing to do. And uh, hopefully... It steers guys more in that direction and sets a, a precedent going forward. Yeah, no, I think it's a great example for, look, there's a lot of fighters that, you know, early on, they don't have the money. They're still living fight the fight and check the check. But a guy like you've been in the USC for a while, has some success. I think it sets a great example for other guys that and shows them like, hey, take care of your people that have been there to help you get to where you're at. So. Yeah. And I've been there too, right? Like it took me 10 years to get in the UFC. I, yeah. I did a long, long time of working odd jobs making minimum wage and like maybe less sometimes where I couldn't help my coaches the way I wanted to. But you know, when you get the chance, when you do have the ability, I think you should hundred percent. All right. Well, before we dive into the fight card, I want to ask you about a future fight, someone that you train with. I don't know if the fight's official yet. It doesn't look like it is, but I think we both agree. It'll probably be Bilal's next fight is the Shavkat fight versus Bilal Muhammad. How often do you train with Shavkat? What do you think about him? And how do you look at that matchup stylistically for him? So Shavkat comes and does camps at Kill Cliff. Um, for his last fight was one was his last fight Wonder Boy? Uh, Jeff somebody? Neal, I think. Jeff Neal. So the one yeah. I, I think I tra I trained with him for that one too, because Jeff Neal is also lefty, but I was I was Wonder Boy for him. Gotcha. Also, which I was probably surprises a lot of people. <laughs> but I give a good Wonder Boy look. I, I was Wonder Boy for uh Tyron a little bit. I was Wonder Boy for Anthony Pettis, and I was Wonder Boy for Shavkat. So gotcha. I, I got some pretty good kicks. Um 
But yeah, they, they're both really, really good. They both present different and unique like styles and like keys to victory. Uh, you know, there's nothing that either of them could get insight for that you can't see on tape, yeah. which is true with most guys. Obviously, Shavkat is an emphatic finisher, mm-hmm. um, but Bilal is really, really hard to be finished. He's got a great gas tank, and it's not like he's never been finished. And just because Shavkat's undefeated, that doesn't mean he has, you know, doesn't have losses somewhere else on his record or whatever. You know right, what I mean? Right. As an amateur, maybe whatever else he was doing. So, you know, everybody's human, but it's that's one of those things, right? Like, Honestly, I, you know, I don't know how that would how that would play out. Uh, yeah. I'd probably have to back my boy Bilal a little bit more just because I've known him longer. But it's yeah. like Bilal's got a great gas tank. His work ethic is like truly unmatched. And, and I'm not just saying that because we're boys. Like I've been around multiple UFC champions, champions outside the UFC, mm-hmm. a lot of like top guys in the world. And I can tell you with absolute confidence if we're talking about pure, unadulterated hard work, He's winning that every single time. Yeah, that doesn't mean that other that people should do what he does, or that right. other guys aren't working hard. That just means he, you know, when people say they do all these crazy workouts, he's a step above that, and he actually does it. And I know he does it because yeah. I've seen it happen. Yeah, like I always give him grief about this. This dude goes to Orange Theory for like fun <laughs> as an extra training. I swear to God, <laughs> every time I'm just like, dude. so apparently that's the key to victory. You got an orange theory near you. You can be a UFC champion. All right, orange theory is now the best base for MMA. Yeah. It's yeah. official. <laughs> so we had Bilal on the podcast back in Vegas. Uh, this was a co- probably a couple months after Gilbert and Bilal fought. So it was a fun dynamic having him come on the pod with me and Gilbert. This was Doran Moicano's uh, USC 300 fight. And I'm telling you, I'll tell you what, when Bilal on the pod there, he was so confident. And now I feel like now that he has the belt, you know how people say like once you get the belt, you're even like stronger or better now, yes. more confident. Yes. I really believe that I think Bilal has the edge in that fight, right? Especially in a five rounder, obviously got to weather a storm against Shavkat in the first, you know, two to three rounds. But his gas tank, man, is just unbelievable. He's confident. He's strong. I don't think Shavkat's taking him down, truly. You know, maybe, you know, maybe he will in an exchange of some sort, but I think Bilal's able to get back to his feet and stay in his face. So I almost have to lean Bilal in that fight. And I think odds makers are just because of the aura of Shavkat, the 17 and of all finishes, whatever the number is. I just feel like odds makers are going to make him the favorite against Bilal. I can see that. Um, even though Bilal's the current champ, but we see it all the time when, you know, champs are underdogs in their, in their fight against a challenger. So I think Bilal will be a small underdog and I think I have to back him there, but I think it's ex- I think it's a very exciting fight. I'm glad it looks like the UFC is going to make that instead of the Usman Bilal fight. I think this fight makes more sense. So, yeah, I I think Shav Khan's definitely earned his shot. Yeah, uh, fin- he's done everything the UFC wants: finish everybody. Like, yeah, not just win decisions. Like undefeated, finished everybody. Like it's a great. I think it's a great right, matchup. Right. I will say that like not that I'm you know gonna pick on either. Like they were going back and forth on Twitter, which I thought was. Pretty funny because I know both of them too, and they're like not like that at all. So yeah, it was yeah. extra funny to see that. <laughs> but I will say, like Bilal did just fight recently, so like, yeah, if he's got to wait a little bit, if he wants that shot right away, then it's like, yeah, you might have to wait a little bit because you know, yeah, he's got he just got the belt, so it's kind of on him now to like decide, you know, does he want to fight, turn around quick and fight in four months, or does he yeah. want to wait six months and make sure he's like extra prepared? So I think yeah. that's you know, if Shavkat wants the belt for sure, the next one then I would say wait. But if he doesn't want to wait and he wants to sneak another one in, he could. But, you know, if you're that close, I don't know why I don't you see would, why he yeah, would, yeah. why you'd rush that. But is it crazy? Because, like, I think quick is, like, relative, right? Like, Bilal said, he's like, I'm going to be an active champion. But then they kind of th- throw that in his face and they're asking him to fight right away. Like, he, like, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but, like, remember the Aljamain O'Malley fight? That was a quick turnaround for Aljo. Oh, yeah. What they were trying to do to Bilal was like twice as fast. Yeah, and that was a fast one. And I'm like, dude, don't don't exaggerate the guy's words. Like he wants to be active, but he's got to recover and train. And like they were trying to get him right back in there. I just thought that was crazy to me. Yeah, no, and I mean, again, it's no longer like three round fights anymore. It yeah. has to be fives now. And like he had a couple of fives before, but now it's five round title fights. You're either going to be the main or the co-main, depending on the card, right? And you got to take 
you got to take time to prepare for that. Not just to prepare for that. You got to recover from the one you just did. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I think in a perfect world, I he'd probably fight every like four to five months if you let him. But even six months, like even if you fight twice a year as a champion, that's yeah. not nothing. That's still a lot than more than a lot of guys. Right. You know what I mean? And it's always ebbs and flows, right? Maybe he... Maybe he gets one and he, you know, he gets in there and he catches somebody, gets out of there quick, and then he can turn around right away. But yeah. he just had a five round fight and like he was pretty dominant, but he still had a five round fight yeah. against Leon Edwards, right. who really, really good fighter. Of course. And he did that in another place, you know, across the, the ocean where he doesn't live. Like <laughs> yeah. he's doing his little victory tour, you know, showing some love to the people. And like yeah. I think people are starting to see now he does have like a very big uh, base of support and fans all over the world yeah right like he went back to the uk just to like celebrate with uh the palestinian fans over there so yeah, yeah. i think I, I think six months is like plenty quick if not you know maybe he wants to go a little bit sooner but i think that would probably be around the time we'd see him back in there 100 percent. and I, I one thing i told uh about jason anik because he's obviously so close to Blau, i told jason i was like bro I love that Bilal's like leaning into the villain role a little bit, like oh, yeah. talking his shit on social media, like talking to Usman, talking to all these guys. Like, I love it because the dude worked so hard for it. And now it's like, you know, everyone kind of counted him out and like, you know, kind of looked over him. And like, once you put the work in and you get it done, like talk your shit. And I, I love to see it because it's, it's really making the division more interesting, I think. Yeah, no, and it. It, it's he has such a way of doing it too yeah. where he's like trash talking but he's not going overboard so if like you like him you're still gonna like him <laughs> but if you don't like him you're really not gonna like him he's like hey hey i won you gotta deal with this now <laughs> he just gets under your skin yeah. he's so good at yeah. getting other people's skin so i love it all right i want to do one more thing here before we d dive into the the vegas 97 card so we do this game on social where it's basically this guy or that guy and we're going to do grappling with you today. So I'm going to give you two fighters. Whoever you take, we're going to move on to the next guy. So I'm going to start off best grappler in the USC at the moment. We're going to start off Bryce Mitchell or Armin Sarukian. Like versus each other? Just pound for pound, best MMA grappler. We'll go Armin Sarukian. Armin Sarukian or Renato Moicano? I got to pick Moicano. <laughs> Renato Moicano. Jalton Almeida. Oh, there's. I'll, I'll go Moicano because Almeida's uh, like big, and big guys just aren't technically as good. <laughs> Renato Moicano or Aljamain Sterling? Ooh, man. I'm sorry, Moicano. I got to go with Aljo <laughs> on that one. Was... <laughs> Aljamain Sterling or Umar Nurmagomedov? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, I'll stick with Aljo just because Umar hasn't got the belt yet. Aljamain Serlin or Brian Ortega? I would still pick Aljo. Aljamain Serlin or Davison Figueredo? Have they fought? No. Nah. Yeah, because he moved up later. Uh, I, grappling, I'll still say Aljo between the two of them. Aljamain Serlin or Paul Craig? <laughs> <laughs> That's I'll, a good one. I'll, I'll go with Aljo just, be, just because I haven't seen him really like take any uh, bad spots on the ground yeah aljamain sterling or hamzat chamayev aljo because he actually finishes submissions aljamain sterling charles Oliveira. oh i gotta go with Oliveira on that one charles Oliveira or gilbert burns gilbert just based off of like i know his jujitsu accolades are <laughs> way higher here's a good one gilbert burns or sean brady uh, i'll still go with gilbert Gilbert Burns or Islam Makashev? Man, I think MMA, well, that's an interesting one. I think MMA-wise, I would go with Makachev just because of the control, but I will say if they were in a jiu-jitsu match, I would pick Gilbert Burns all day. So we're going MMA, so we're going Islam. So yeah. Islam Makachev or GM3? Oh, me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll finish there. You're the pound for pound best grappler in the UFC. So, all right, let's move on. USC Vegas 97 for all you sports betters out there. We're going to put the link in the description right now. We're going to do a full breakdown on the card. We'll build a parlay here at the end of the show. But if you want to get some free coin to get some action on this weekend's USC card, go click the link into the YouTube description right now and check out our sponsor Fliff. 
Let's dive into, we're not going to go through this entire card, but if there's any fights that really stand out to you that you want to cover, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the first thing, the first one that I definitely want to bring up. Let's go to the prelims, Kyle. If you scroll down a little bit, there's one prelim here just because you've already fought Andre Petrosky. So I want to, I want to dive into this matchup. If you can scroll down, Kyle, or is it on the main? Oh, there it is. There it is. All right. Andre Petrosky versus Dylan Butka. So I like this matchup grappler versus grappler matchup. Bucca's coming off the loss to Caesar Almeida. Uh, he got three takedowns in that fight, but couldn't really hold Almeida down. And Almeida has that kickboxing, uh, you know, skill set to him where he was able to to get the TKO in that fight. Petrosky's kind of been up and down, right? I think Michelle Pereira faced him or beat him. You had that split decision with him where you outstruck him, mm. but he was able to get the nod. Um, this is, I think, a closer fight than the odds make it. But I want to get your opinion on this because. You know, I believe Petrosky's a near three to one favorite on Fliff. Yeah, that seems kind of steep. I'm not super familiar with Budka, but just from what I can remember, I would think Petrosky has a little bit of an edge takedown wise. And I'm a little biased too because I fought him. So yeah. I like he's got a he's got a tricky little single leg finish. Uh you've seen him take a lot of guys down and hold most people down. Um that being said, but because also kind of a wrestler grappler mm -hmm. and I was definitely find ways to like not get held down too much. So I think that'll probably end up making it more of a contest on the feet. Yeah. Uh, and I would give a little bit of an advantage to Petrosky in that sense. Like obviously, you know, he, he cracked me with a good one before. And like when he's feeling confident, he lets his hands go. It, it's not bad. I mean, he makes up for, kind of having a shorter reach with toughness and like not being afraid to shoot takedowns. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would, I think three to one's a little bit steep for those odds. Yeah, no, I agree. I think for a, for an official show pick here, I would go with Andre Petrosky, but man, that's, that's a tough number to play on him. I would maybe even look at like a round two, three here where he had that nice finish. Of, or you remember against Nick's Nick Maximoff. Yeah. He had yeah. That submission. I almost wonder, cause you know, that's a grappler. I almost wonder if he could, find something like that in this matchup or if you're right like you know grappler versus grappler do we see you know this play out more on the feet here so i'm interested to see this one i don't want to go through all the prelims but i did want to to highlight that fight so let's move on to the main card here um let's go to kyle nelson versus steve garcia the match now fight by the way is canceled match now versus costa which i'm really upset about because i wanted to take costa by ko in that in that matchup um but Steve Garcia, Kyle Nelson, I think this is a great matchup. Kyle Nelson had that impressive finish over, over Algio. And then Steve Garcia is putting away everyone. I think he's on a few fight finish streak here. Um, but he's just a monster, a big dude for the for the featherweight division. I believe he's a near minus 190 favorite on Fliff here. Let's see. Or no, he's up to over minus 200 on Fliff right now. Uh, Nelson's around a plus 160, plus 170 underdog. What do you think about this matchup stylistically? Man, I, I would have to lead towards Garcia because he's one of those guys. I think because he doesn't, uh, I don't mean this in a messed up way, by the way, Garcia, if you listen to this, because I'm kind of in the same boat, but he doesn't look like the most physically imposing guy. So you kind of forget that like he's out there finishing a lot of people yeah. and he's knocking a lot of dudes out. Um, so I think I would lean towards him just a little bit. I think he, he's got the ability to like, keep it on the feet where he wants it. And he just has a, a little bore, a little bit more of a mean streak in him to just let those hands go. And uh, yeah, especially in that apex cage, it's a little bit smaller and you're kind of forced to, to yeah. scrap in there a little bit. So I think, 100%. I think I go with him on that one. Dude, so he's finished four guys in a row, all within the first or second round. So he put away Chase Hooper back in October, 2022. I think Chase has really improved since then, but that was still a great uh, performance. Um, the the Nerd and Beckoff fight, he put him away in the second round after getting caught in the first round. So he shows that he can get put through adversity, still come back and win. Um, because he got almost put out in that first round, I believe. I think I was at that fight live. That was back in April 2023. That was the Pereira Adesanya two card. Then Melky Costa, he finishes him in the second round with elbows. And then his last fight, round one finished too. So four fights in a row, he's won by knockout. It's almost hard to not auto bet this guy by knockout at this point. I will say he does put himself in danger, though, so I almost wonder if Kyle Nelson could maybe find a, an early shot because we do see Garcia does get hit early at times. So um, this is a tough fight. 
Garcia, four fight win streak. Kyle Nelson, three fight win streak. So I'll be interested to see how this fight plays out. But I think Garcia is the better finisher overall. So I think that's where you know he's more finishing equity in this in this spot. So I think it's a good matchup. I'm gonna go Garcia for the show pick, but I will be looking to see what the Kyle Nelson by knockout number would pay here. Because at the end of the day, I bet numbers. That's what people don't get. Is I'm not betting on fighters. I'm betting on numbers. If you try to make a profit on this sport or any sport. It's about the numbers. It's, you know, oh, I never told you the Paul Craig story. This actually brought me uh, a flashback to that. So the Paul Craig, everyone makes fun of me because I would take Paul Craig by knockout. They're like, the dude never knocks anyone out. I was like, point. (laughs) right, right. I was like, look, guys, in sports betting, if it never happens, that means the odds are astronomically high, right? That's why I take all these crazy shots. My favorite thing to do betting MMA is take submission guys to win by knockout and knockout guys to win by submission or decision. Right, because everyone and their mom is betting on the most likely outcome, right? Which is you by submission, or you know uh, Steve Garcia by knockout, or you know all these things that are expected to happen. That's what everyone bets on. So back when Paul Craig fought Andre Muniz, I don't know if you remember that. I had round two and three knockout. I had round two at I believe it was thirty nine to one, either twenty nine or thirty nine to one. It was insane. I ended up hitting like over 10 grand on that bet because he ended up getting a ground and pound on Muniz in the second round. And uh, ever since then, I would bet on Paul Craig knockouts because the odds didn't even really change much even after it happened. So everyone would just make fun of me because I would bet him. I took him against Kaya and obviously that played out that played out horribly. But I always try to tell uh, the betting world out there is like you hit one long shot at 30 to one. I can lose 29 in a row against right. on the same bet. You're still, and up. still up money, but they don't get that part. <laughs> You know, so as dumb as it looks sometimes, it, like be, I can have these huge misses and it's still like profitable long term at times doing these strategies. So it's not always going to work out well. But um, in the Steve Garcia, Kyle Nelson fight, for example, like a contrarian play here would be to take one of these guys by decision or submission. Right. Because probably one of one of the two guys are going to win by knockout here. So we'll see what happens in that fight. This next one I'm super excited for uh, Jessica Andrade versus Natalia Silva. Andrade, uh, you know, everyone says women's MMA, it's boring, no finishes. That's not the case <laughs> No, in this fight, right? Jessica Andrade is an absolute killer. Now, it is interesting seeing her more often in flyweight now, right? Because, like, when you go back, when she was a weight class down, like, she was ragged on. Like, she dropped rows on her head, finished her. Like, so I think it's harder for her to get these finishes with just pure raw power and aggression. Now it's just she's fighting bigger women and... She has to use more technique, I think, which she's shown she can do at times. Mm-hmm. Two fight win streaks. She beat Mackenzie Dern by knockout, by the way, or TKO, and then Marina Rodriguez, which Marina Rodriguez is to me is high level. That was a great win. Um, but Natalia Silva, up and coming prospect, uh, she's on a good win streak of her own. One, two, three, four, five straight wins in the UFC. This is another fight where it's like you probably lean Silva, but the odds. Again, minus 280 up to minus 300 on some books. What do you think about this matchup? Can Andrade kind of outdog her here and walk her down? Or you think Silva's just really good off her back foot and more technical? I would think, uh, well, this this is one where the little cage might come into play a little bit more. That's a great point. They, they are shorter, a little bit smaller, but like, yeah. so it's a little bit different than when I'm in there just because I'm a little bit taller. But you yeah. know, even when I'm in there, I got about two and a half steps. Tell them back against the cage, they might have three and a half steps. Uh, so that's something to consider if Andrade really bites down and decides she's just going to get in there and do her little, like, Mike Tyson impersonation and just be in Silva's face. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I was to, like, be in Andrade's corner, be like, look, you know, you got a bob and weave on the inside. Silva needs to keep you at bay. Get in there, throw some nasty stuff, and be okay with falling into a clinch as long as you're either stifling her punches or punching and you know grabbing the legs out from under her to get an easy takedown. Whether or not she stays down, don't worry about that too much. Just punch, 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 latch a hold of her so she can't move. Mm-hmm. Silva kind of needs the space, and she's good at using it. I, I would say she's better, uh, better on the feet as far as shot selection, distance management. She uses her lead kick up top well. Um, I would think in a three-round fight, as long as she gets started first and establishes that range, she should be able to like throw enough numbers and at least like show enough rushes in just to, you know, mess with Andrade to be like, Hey, I might come in and pursue you to like 
keep her from just walking her down the whole time. Mm-hmm. So if I, you know, if I had to make a bet on who's going to win, I would lead towards Silva. But like, there's definitely a path to victory for Andrade. It's just, you know, and it's harder when you're in there. Trust me. I am fully aware <laughs> to just be like, well, just don't worry about what they do. Just go forward. It's like, yeah, yeah. maybe I don't want to get punched directly in the face. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but uh, I, w- I would lean a little more towards Silva. I don't know if I'd lean plus 285 towards Silva, but yeah, I would definitely uh, pick her if I had to make a pick. Right. Yeah. I, I struggle with this one. I think you bring up a great point though, about the small cage here and like Andrade is going to come forward, but we seen her get caught doing that in the, which fight was that? The Yan fight. She walked forward and got starched in the first round. Uh, was that that was at USC 288? Yeah, I was at that. I don't know Sterling versus Hudo. I don't remember if I was at that fight, but she basically walked right into a shot in the first round, and she was favored in that fight. But since then, she lost to Tatiana Suarez, which I think beats most of the division with her wrestling. Yeah, and then she put on a nice two win, you know, two fight win streak after that. So I'm a little bit torn here. As far as a pick, I would take Silva, but as a betting pick, I almost got a lean dog here. At dog money plus plus two thirty, I think I think we're gonna see that number over plus two fifty by Saturday. So, uh, what do you think about like? Uh, do you think Andrade can maybe even find? I mean, she has some nice Andrade chokes. by submission. That's what Dude. I was just gonna say. Yeah. Sprinkle some on that instead of KO. <laughs> Andrade submission. That's music to my ears. Everyone that watches the show, you guys know I love my submission props. So, yeah. Uh, did you see what? What did you make of the one submission against? Do you see it uh, when Andrade fought Amanda Lemos? Does the stand in arm triangle? Oh yeah, that's, that was insane, bro. So I, uh, former teammate of mine, Emmanuel Sanchez, he hit that in Bellator back in the day. And I've, uh, if you go way, way back, and I'm, you know, a little bit more of a fight nerd than most people, but like when I got into MMA, I got into like Pride first, and that took me down the rabbit hole of like Pancrase and Deep and like uh, uh, Shudo back in the day, which was like kind of like MMA. It was like kickboxing with some grappling, but. Part of the whole thing was it was mostly kickboxing on the feet, but then you would see submissions. And one of the big things was a standing arm triangle. So I'd see guys do that, and they even had, like, a quote-unquote big gloves on. So it's like it's something that's there, and you're seeing it happen or at least be threatened more and more in MMA. Uh, it's just that you got to have the right mixture of, like, you got to be just tall enough or short enough depending on who the opponent is. And, like, Andrade, you got to be strong enough to yeah. latch on in that position and yeah. keep it. So. Yeah, that, that was a cool one, and that's the thing. Andrade gets on top or gets her against the fence. You know, so she tries to spin in, and her arm gets too long, and, you know, she gets lashed onto that neck. That that could be it. Yeah. I, I want to see with that. I, I'd imagine if she's almost, you know, two and a half to one underdog, I bet you that submission prop is going to be north of, like, six to one, seven to one. So especially in women's MMA, you see those finishing props super high up there. So I'm going to take a look at that. I could see Natalia Silva by decision. Um, I could also see Andrade by submission. Um, maybe Andrade could walk into something and Silva could get a knockout. But Silva, to me, doesn't. she don't seek those finishes. She would rather kind of outpoint you. And, I mean, she does have some. She has – so she has two in the UFC and then three decisions. So that's actually not bad. Um, but it doesn't look like she's, like, out there, like, trying to go for those finishes. It's one of those things with her. It's like she's going to fight her style, and if it happens, great. Um, so I, that's a very interesting matchup, but all right, let's move on to the, co- to the main event. I'm so excited for this fight, bro. Like bias aside, Gilbert on the podcast and being close with both of us. I think this is a great stylistic matchup. I understand the odds a little bit, right? Gilbert is, you know, the older fighter. He is coming off of a, a loss and a finish where Sean Brady has put together, you know, a decent win streak. Not actually, it's only a one fight win streak since Bilal, but if you look at previous to that, right, he has some really impressive performances. I think the submission win over Jake Matthews is actually very underrated. Uh, The Michael Chiesa win, that one, you know, is a decision win, but he he pretty much dominated that fight on the ground. He had five takedowns to Chiesa's one. Um, And then prior to that, he is, you know, he had a a guillotine back in in 2020 and two decisions. He beat Court McGee. Um, So this is just a, I think if if you're on the Sean Brady side, you kind of look at it as he's the younger guy. Uh, you know, he he's getting better. He's arguably entering his prime here, and his grappling has looked really good. Obviously, super strong guy. You know, the Kelvin Gassum submission was nice. Um, but at the flip side, if you look at Gilbert, been here, done that, fought five rounders. You know, he kind of took the aura away from Hamzat a little bit, right? Like he made Hamzat look 
uninvincible, right, in that fight. And, you know, again, he's been in, he's been there and done that in the five-round fights. So I kind of think it's a little crazy for him to be this big of an underdog. I look at this fight more of a pick em, and that's even with, that, with me taking my bias out of the equation here. Um, I think these guys, you know, you tell me because you have much better insight, but I think they're grappling in a way kind of cancels each other out here. And I think Gilbert possesses the better striking and power on the feet. But I would love to hear your insight on, on what you think. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're pretty on the money there. And I would say uh, I, I would say for sure the Jake Matthews win for Sean Brady is a lot bigger of a deal than people give him credit for. Yeah. Because the other argument is Gilbert for sure has the better strength of schedule. Absolutely. He's fought bigger names, uh, probably tougher opponents. But that's not to say that Sean Brady hasn't fought tough guys yeah. or, or beaten tough guys. Um, I would say grappling-wise, if you're looking at purely jiu-jitsu, I think a lot of people are underestimating. They're not overestimating Sean, but they are underestimating Gilbert. This is a guy who has won a lot of prestigious jiu-jitsu titles. Yeah. Uh, this is a guy who just like a year or two ago submitted Rafael Lovato Jr. in a grappling match, who I've trained with before. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's... Uh, I got a strike from him on my black belt. He's an amazing grappler. Very, very tough. Mm -hmm. For Gilbert to come in and do that is absolutely nuts. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think maybe Brady would have a slight edge on the wrestling if we're just going off of, like, their MMA fights. But even then, if you get Gilbert down, I don't know that you're going to hold him down, first mm -hmm. of all. And second of all, you're dealing with a guy that has, like, ridiculous, not just ridiculous jujitsu credentials, but he... Also, it clearly translated that very, very well into MMA. Um, one thing I hear a lot uh, from guys that train with Brady is how strong he is. Yeah. Uh, I Obviously, the guy's building a tank. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure he's strong. I think the bigger thing is, is that he's very patient on top. And as opposed to, like, holding and squeezing, he just knows how to distribute his weight and keep height when he's on the ground, especially when he's on guys' backs. Uh, he's got very good forward pressure with his hips, and he kind of floats above you and makes sure that his head and his hips always have height so that his weight is always coming down on top of you and that if you move, he can move to the next spot before you can. So he's never really like, you know, on the back and going to his back to get a choke. He's on the back and insisting on being on top, and I think that plays a very big role in his success. That and the, the wrist rise and the hand trapping. Um I would also say that another big thing to look at in this fight is that uh, Sean Brady's probably got better striking than people give him credit for, yeah. uh, especially technique-wise. But when Gilbert wants to fight somebody and he yeah. starts slinging leather, that dude is very, very tough on the feet, and he can yeah. crack. Like he, like you're just saying, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hamzat. He was busting him up on the feet, and he's not afraid to get in there and get down and dirty. Yeah, I have seen Brady in fights before kind of give ground and it could be strategically but kind of give ground when pressure's put on him with the hands uh you got to watch for his takedowns off of that because he's still very good at changing levels and driving through when he does give that space um but if the grappling is going to cancel each other out or maybe give a little bit of an edge to gilbert if he goes out there and just lets his hands fly and like gets mean and nasty with the hands especially in a three or uh, even in a five round fight yeah i think it's going to really deter brady from trying to like do what he wants to do. And, uh, you know, as long as he never gets settled on top, I, I would, you know, obviously I'm a little bit biased, but I'm yeah. leaning towards Gilbert. Yeah. Uh, so Gilbert's, I believe, the only guy to drop Hamzat and Hamzat and Usman. Or land a knockdown on both those guys. So that to me is very impressive. And I think you nailed the, the, the analysis because Sean Brady does have better hands than what people think. But I think if I have to pick... If, if someone said to me, put these two guys in, no takedowns, no grappling, who's going to win a dog fight on the feet? I'm going Gilbert, you know? Right. And that's the way I look at this fight. I think he's locked in. Dude has, hey, Gilbert, he hasn't been on the pod in, in weeks, so I know he's dialed in right now. <laughs> he's you know, he's so, been training. <laughs> he's been training. He's dialed in. Title, title run starts now. That's his philosophy. You know, he's 38 years old now. This is it, right? We, he's going in there. He's going in to put Sean Brady away in a five-rounder. Um, I think he, I think there's a world where he could win by TKO. I think there's a world where he could win on the scorecards, you know, if he's able to inflict more damage in, you know, three of the five rounds. Um, but I'm not I, – I know Gilbert's not taking this fight lightly, and I think we both understand at the same time that how good Sean Brady is. Like, 
And he's a Philly guy, so I'm a big fan of Sean Brady. Um, but Gilbert's my guy. Of course, I'm going with him. I'm excited to watch the fight this weekend. I got to figure out how much um, how much I'm, I'm laying down on, on Gilbert here. <laughs> yeah. I haven't decided yet. So when I went to Moikana's fight live with Jalen Turner, he was up to like plus 150, I think. I don't know if you remember, but Moikana was up there. I put 10K on him, and we went to the fight. It was, and dude, when he got knocked down in the first round, <laughs> I, I, we, were, we were live on the camera. We were, we were like IG live or something. They were in a fight. And I was like, holy shit. I just lost 10 bands. And then he gets, he pops right back up to his feet. And then round two, dude, it was so electric. But I'm hoping Gilbert doesn't put me through that type of, uh, that type of stress. But no, I just, again, I think this is a very pick em type fight. I really believe the odds are only like this because of the trajectory of, Sean Brady, how good he's looked recently, and the age factor. Um, but I think Gilbert's now healthy. He's locked in. And, dude, we didn't even talk about Gilbert fought how many times in a row so quickly. So he fought Jack Della. He fought, uh, what, March 2024. But before that, he fought three fights in in five in four months. He fought Neil Magny in January. Then three months later, he fights Masvidal in Miami. And then Bilal a month later. Like, I know the Masvidal fight, he didn't take a ton of damage. But, like, that's got to play, you know, a play a factor on you. Like, even, just, even before that, in the COVID era, he, like, he fought Usman and then, like, yeah. Tyrone Woodley not long after that. Like, two of the biggest, like, longest reigning welterweight champs, two of, like, the biggest killers ever. And, yeah. like, <laughs> both of those fights, he was... <laughs> Given as good as he was getting, you right, know what I right, mean? Like right. he won one, he lost one, but like he was still dropping them and getting dropped. Like those were, he's fighting all super, super legit dudes while they are like right at <laughs> or like just before or after yeah. their peak of their like reign. So that's, you know, that's not nothing. 100%. I always think about that clip when he's in the octagon with Joe Rogan. He's like, Joe, if I get offered, I'm the only one in the UFC. If I get offered a fight against anyone, what am I going to say, Joe? And he's like, I forget what Joe said. What's Joe say? <laughs> he's like, you're going to take it. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a great clip. Um, all right. Well, I think we're both going Gilbert, but I want to hear your official prediction. Like, how do you think if he gets it done, how do you think it is? Is it a five round decision? Is it a TKO? Is it early? Is it late? What do you think? Uh, I, well, best case scenario, I think he lets the hands go right away, stuffs a few shots. And I think he's looking at like a second round TKO. I think if he... Watch the Bilal fight. Obviously, it's not going to be exactly like that. But, you know, there's a, a, a similar path there, I think, if he puts on enough pressure uh, and, like, again, just let some hard shots fly because Sean will kind of take time to analyze. Uh, and if you don't give him that space and time to analyze, he's going to have to take a bad shot, and that's going to be easier to defend and get back on your offense. Um, so that would be – I think that would be the smart play there uh and you know sean brady's going to be looking to like he's probably going to try to like pressure a little bit initially himself just to not let that happen yeah because you know you let gilbert get going and build or anybody really but especially gilbert get going and get confidence it's going to be more and more frequent and more likely that he starts throwing heat and yeah. that's you know going to be worse for him so i think he's going to try and jam him up early and take some shots but if gilbert can push through that and just you know even if a couple of them hit the guard early anyway and just kind of crap, crack them a few times, yeah, uh, I would say look for that like second, third round TKO. I heard someone, on, I forget who it was, but someone on social said, whoever lands the first takedown in this fight wins. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I don't really know about that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially like because the first takedown, is, it, is that the first takedown in like round three because all the other ones got stuffed? Or yeah, is that yeah. the first takedown because one of them swings big and the other one slips like, Say Gilbert comes out, he throws a big old hook. Sean Brady shoots underneath it. Gilbert pops right back up. Right, right. What does that do for anybody? Yeah. Or even vice versa. Sean tries to throw something. Gilbert wants to prove point, takes him down, throws a couple like quick rabbit punches, and then Sean pops back up. Right. Like that. I don't, I don't know. I think that's a little bit too of a yeah. too much of a narrow minded take. <laughs> agreed, agreed. I just think the mentality. It's like I think Sean's gonna be the one shooting early, bro. I just think Gilbert can stuff the takedowns. Keep it on the feet and then pressure. And we've seen the, like you said, we've seen the path with Bilal. Um, and, you know, Brady was the first one to get put away by Bilal on the feet. So I think Gilbert has to look at that and and take some encouragement from it and just march forward, bro. I, I can't wait to see this fight. I'm super excited. So 
All right, let's let's build a quick parlay here before we end the show. So we'll just we'll keep it simple. So just to recap, let me pull this up. We are now one in three on our show parlays. But remember, guys, parlays are plus money, so that doesn't mean we're down money. We are hundred dollar. If you put a hundred dollars on all four of our show parlays, you're actually up sixty seven dollars. So we're in the green, which means there's a lot of pressure on GM three and I to give a winner today. Because <laughs> if we lose today, we are in the red. All right, so we're one in three, up sixty-seven dollars. We're gonna go two legs. So you're gonna give a pick, I give a pick, and it can be anything. It's supposed to be a conservative play, like it can be a favorite, it can be an over/under, it can be a fight to go the distance, it can be really anything. But is there anything on this card, prelims or main event, that you're like, that's the play? This guy, this girl, she's not losing. Oof. And I know it's hard to do. And then they, <laughs> the worst thing ever to do. Was we didn't fight. talk about the Ryan Spann fight at all. I don't know if you have anything on that one, but that's an interesting matchup. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. Especially, uh, I know old Vince, he, he's a cool dude, but it's like kind of for both of them, right? Like, yeah, sometimes Ryan Spann and sometimes Ovens come out and they look like world beaters. And then sometimes, yeah. you know, it's just Ryan Spann's one guy I cannot figure out from a betting standpoint, bro. I've lost so much money on that dude. I took him. I, I like his submission games. He's got these nasty guillotines and he's really strong. And then he's got knockout power. But like there's something missing about him where he just doesn't put it together and isn't consistent. And he started like there was that whole story about how he started really training and getting into it. And like, yeah, I just can't figure him out. And now, you know, oh, it's like we see him this last fight. He went the distance with Kennedy and won a decision, which I can't even imagine what that would have paid for that fight to get the distance. But this fight, I don't know what to do with it. Ryan Spann's weight. You, you'll find me dead before I take Ryan Spann at minus 350 against anybody. And I can't wild. trust him anymore. So I, I'm going to personally skip that fight. Maybe I'll, I'll play like a prop or something on my full card. Uh, but is there any... Is there any fighters that you're like, we got to throw in the parlay? Or even a fight to not go the distance or go the distance as a leg? Uh, I would say Trevor Peak and maybe even Peak to go to the distance. You think? I, so I you think, like that fight to go the distance? Yeah, I think that'd be a good one to go to the distance. Okay, because I, mean, I know he's super tough, but you know the the line's pretty close on that one. Yeah. So I'm I'm guessing that that's going to be most likely a fight where like you know we've seen him get into brawls before, but yeah, throw him on a parlay to win, and then maybe even one to go to the distance. Okay. Um. I think we would have to do one or the other because I don't think you can combine them. Which one do you like better, him to win or the fight to go over a certain amount of rounds or to the full distance? Uh, I'll say him to win. Okay. All right. That keeps it simple. So Trevor Peak, leg number one. We're going to take him on the money line here. Let me pull up and see what that is on Fliff. Just a reminder, guys, link in the description if you want to tail the show parlay and get uh, – if you're a new user for Fliff, you're going to get some free coin to play with. All right, so Trevor Peak right now, you're going to get him at minus 130. That's perfect on Fliff. I'm going to lock in a second leg here. I got to go Gilbert, bro. <laughs> Even though he's an underdog, usually we're taking like, you know, things more likely from an odd standpoint to happen, like minus 150s, minus 250s. Nah, we're going Gilbert plus 250. It would be crazy if we didn't do that. Here's what the lay is. Trevor Peak money line, GM3 is going with leg number one. I'm going Dorino. Plus 150 on the money line right now on flip. That's actually a really good number. $100 is going to return you 442 total. So 342 in net profit. So if you put $100 and those two fighters win, you're going to get back $342 in net profit. I like that lay. I like that two legger. So Trevor Peak's a tough dude. I don't know a ton about his competition though. I don't either. I'm just going <laughs> off of his pure toughness. Yeah. And, and, and he's dude's... coming off of he he needs this win too. Yeah. Let me see his his last few. So he yeah, he lost to Charlie Campbell. Charlie Campbell can put guys away and he went the distance with him. Um so that was that was impressive. And then the fight before he beat Muhammad Yaya. The Chepe fight I think aged very well because he went the distance with Chepe and Chepe is a dog. He put a beat down on uh, Damon Jackson. Yeah. I mean, so I, I like this. So we're going to go Trevor Peak money line, Gilbert Burns money line, 100 to pay 442 total. Guys, go tail it with the code show me on the Fliff app. Go get you some free coin and put that parlay in to ride with us. All right. Any last words? Any last thoughts on the card here before we wrap up? Anyone we didn't touch on that you're like, oh, I got to 
give you some insight on this guy or this guy. Um, I think we covered a lot of the good fights, but if yeah. there's anyone else that you think. Nothing else that jumps out at me. Okay, great. All right, guys, go tail the lay. Appreciate GM3 for coming on to the podcast. Please, guys, while you're here, it helps us a ton to subscribe. Don't just like, don't just watch. Hit the like and subscribe button, and we'll see you guys next week, hopefully with Gilbert Burns back fresh off a win. And Moicano, Moicano, come back to the pod, bro. I know you're trying to renegotiate your deal, but you got to come back to the show. So we'll see you guys next week.